He's a member of the Israeli Academy of Sciences, of the uh, National Engineering Academy of the United States, among others. In 1986, he received the uh, Physics Prize of the Friedenberg Fund for the Advancement of Science and Education. In 1987, the International uh, Prize for uh, Novel Materials of the American Physical Society. In 1988, the New England Academic of Technion. In 1990, the Rothschild Prize in Engineering. 1993, the Weissman Prize of Science. 1998, the uh, Physics Prize in Israel. 1999, the Wolf Prize in Physics. In 2000, the Amenov Prize of the Royal Academy of Sciences of uh, Sweden. And the Muriel and David Jacknow for Excellence uh, of Teaching in uh, Technion. All of these prizes, of course, would lead one to assume that he would, in fact, be awarded the Nobel Prize in 2011. He won it in chemistry, but as you can see, you know, he goes all the way from uh, mechanical engineering through chemistry, uh, physics, and in fact, the Nobel Prize is in chemistry for the discovery of uh, quasi-crystals, something which for many years was deemed something that would not exist and he was uh, an example, he set an example for scientists by sticking to, what, to his findings and in fact unraveling a very beautiful aspect of nature. So we are very privileged and honored to have you here and uh, I don't know what the title of your talk is but considering the amplitude of your interests it could be anything, right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for this. Uh, you know, um, all this is true, but this is not the most important part of my life. The most important one is that I have uh, 10 grandchildren and four children and one wife. <laughs> that is more important. Okay, so the subject of my talk, as you can see, the discovery of quasi periodic materials. I will tell you what they are. I will tell you how I found them and uh, what happened uh, next. So it's the, you'll hear an interesting uh, story, if I can uh, learn how to do this. Yeah, I did. Okay, now in order to understand what happened, let me take you back to the mid 80s. In the mid 80s, there were three surprising discoveries on the structure of matter and its properties. And they came year after year from 1984, 85 and 86. And all three of them received the Nobel Prize year after year. The first one, chronologically, was the discovery of quasi-periodic crystals, which is my discovery, and the names on the first publication are my name, and <laughs> Ilan Blech, Denis Gratias, and John Kahn. I will tell you about these people, a very interesting people. A year later came the discovery of fullerens, and um, a year later came the discovery of high-temperature superconductivity. Very important discovery. So, when high temperature superconductivity was discovered, uh, in, uh, the, everybody was happy about it. Uh, there was no rejection, there was no objection. Of course, uh, superconductivity was known since 1909, but it was thought to exist only at very low temperatures, up to 30K or something. And when high temperature superconductivity was discovered, moving from liquid helium to liquid nitrogen, everybody was happy. There was no objection to the discovery. When fullerens were discovered, again, there was no objection to the discovery. What are fullerens? It's a flat layer of graphite that falls to make a ball. This is it. So, again, very nice, everybody was happy. But when quasi-periodic materials were discovered, they met with a lot of resistance. And, and the reason for that, I will tell you, and I know that you will understand. There was a good basis for the resistivity, for the resistance. Now, in order for you to understand my talk, everything will be extremely simple. Then I would like you, the, to those of you who are a little bit away from uh, the science of crystallography, I want you to know about three things. Number one, I want you to know about order, about periodicity, and about rotational symmetry. It will take a couple of minutes. So, here we have a drawing of uh, 
uh, one layer of atoms. It's a two-dimensional drawing. And clearly you see that there is order here. How do you know? If I ask you to continue this to the right or down here or any direction, you will know exactly what to do. You understand the order. That's it. Now, what about periodicity? Look at this red line which marks a direction in the two-dimensional lattice. This direction, if you look at it, you see that there is periodicity. The distance between this atom and this is the same as from this to this and so on. This periodicity. And because the lattice is periodic, this periodicity in each and every direction. For instance, in this direction you see the periodicity. In this direction you see the periodicity. Every direction that you choose, there is periodicity. That's it. What about rotation symmetry? We have here the same drawing. I now added a little uh, handle up here so that you see what happens when I rotate this. And uh, this, um, this lattice has a four-fold rotation symmetry. What does it mean? It means that you can turn it 90 degrees and it looks the same. 180 looks the same. 270 degrees it looks the same. And 360 it looks the same. So you can do it four times. This has four-fold rotation symmetry. That's it. Now let's say a couple of words about rotation symmetry. An image has a rotation symmetry. If there is a center point around which the object is turned a certain number of degrees, and the object still looks the same, it means that it matches itself a number of times while it is being rotated. Let me give you examples from your life. OK, card. This card has a two-fold rotation symmetry. It means that you can rotate it 180 degrees, it looks the same, and 360 looks the same. OK? The, um, the triangle here, the set of triangles, it has a three-fold rotation symmetry. The flower, five-fold rotation symmetry. The pizza, six-fold rotation symmetry, and so on and so forth. These are rotation symmetries of a motif. And in, re in real life, a set, a molecule. You can call it a molecule. OK, so that's rotation symmetry. Now, let me say a few words about crystallography. But before we read, let me tell you something about crystallography. <coughs> the science of crystallography started hundreds of years ago, maybe more. People saw that crystals that they found in nature or they grew in the laboratory, they have specific shapes and they have facets. And the angles between the facets repeated themselves. So different minerals had the same facets. So people understood that if there are atoms in the material, as people thought since the Greeks, then they must be arranged in a certain order. And uh, the science of crystallography progressed very, very slowly. But a word of wisdom. If you look back into any science, you can find a thin thread of truth going back to the Greeks or to the Romans or to other countries. Very thin. So you say, oh, even the Greeks understood crystallography. No. No. Most of the stuff that was said those days was sheer nonsense. They did not understand much about science. But going back, you can find a thin thread of truth. And we are very happy about it. Most of what people said was not relevant. Now, the, the science of crystallography started 101 years ago with the experiment by von Laue, who performed the first X-ray diffraction experiment. He took X-rays, a monochromatic beam of X-rays, and X-rays were discovered in 1895, you know, by, by Rentgen. He took a monochromatic beam and put it onto a crystal, I think it was zinc selenide, and created the first X-ray diffraction pattern. And by doing so, he provided the tool to analyze crystals. The equation to do that came a year later by the Bragg, the father and the son, and young Mr. Bragg, was 26 years old when he was awarded the Nobel Prize. Still the youngest till today. 
And uh, because this happened in uh, 1913, the Bragg equation, then this year was supposed to be the year of crystallography. But because of budget problems, is the next year that will be the year of crystallography. <laughs> Real life conquer science sometimes. Anyway, so this is a crystallography. But let's look at it. Before X-ray crystallography, before X-ray crystallography, remember the words, people looked at facets and measured angles between them and realized truly, correctly, what the structure would be. But when X-ray diffraction came into the game, a new generation of bold, young, avant-garde scientists, the X-ray crystallographers, came to being and they declare themselves the scientists. Those people who measure angles, that's not real science. We have the tool, we have X-ray diffraction. And the science was called X-ray crystallography. And the name was very important because crystallographers believed in X-ray diffraction as the main tool to study crystals. And X-ray diffraction evolved into being a very precise tool Machines, X-ray diffraction machines became more and more accurate over time and it became really a smart tool, a very precise tool. And the other tools like electron diffraction or neutron diffraction, that's not accurate. It was not accepted into the community of X-ray crystallographers. And this is important as you will see. So this is a story, a brief story of uh, the science of crystallography and what I told you is written there. Now, up until 1991, there was a definition for a crystal. And the definition was something like this. Here is one definition from a book uh, by Kaliti, X-ray diffraction. And that definition is so. A crystal is a solid composed of atoms arranged in a pattern periodic in three dimensions. This was crystal, very simple, very clear. Very simple. And this is the foundation on which the science of crystallography lies. This is the foundation. Another, de another definition, another book, same thing, different words. Atoms in a crystal are arranged in a pattern that repeats itself in three dimensions throughout the interior of the crystal. Again, a crystal is ordered and periodic. This is it. This was the, this was the, um, the definition of a crystal. Now, if you looked uh, at, uh, at uh, books like Introduction to Solid State Physics by Charles Kittel, you could see things like this. I know that you cannot see what's marked here in green. This is why I, I enlarged it for you, and now you can. And it says the following. We can make a crystal from molecules which individually, each molecule, have a five-fold rotation axis. But we should not expect the lattice to have five-fold rotation axis. It means a molecule like the flowers that I showed before, can have a five-fold rotation symmetry. But the lattice itself cannot have rotation symmetry, five-fold rotation symmetry. Why so? I will show you. So this was the wisdom. Now, in order to illustrate it, I'll show you a picture of uh, atoms in uh, a periodic lattice. This is diamond. And this is a picture I took many years ago. Uh, and the, uh, the white dots that you see are atoms. These are carbon atoms in diamond. And clearly you see that it is ordered and you can also see that it is periodic. Each and every direction that you choose, for instance, look at this direction, you see the periodicity. Look at this direction, you see the periodicity. Look at this direction, you see the periodicity. Any direction that you choose, you see periodicity because it is a periodic lattice. And in a periodic lattice like this, the rotational symmetries that are allowed are one, two, three, four, and six. No five and nothing beyond six is allowed as rotational symmetry. It was true. It is true for periodic crystals. One, two, three, four, six. No five and nothing beyond six. Okay, this is the wisdom. Now, when I was a student at the Technion, I took a class uh, of... Um, crystallography, and in the final exam, I had to prove that five-fold rotation symmetry cannot exist in crystals. 
and I proved it, and I passed the exam, and this is why I'm here now. <laughs> so, let me show you one way to prove that five-fold rotation symmetry is not allowed in periodic crystals, but all crystals were periodic. So, let's take two atoms, P and Q, and choose these two atoms in such a way that the distance R between them is the minimum distance between two atoms in that lattice. Okay, R is the minimum distance. And now if five-fold rotation symmetry is allowed, then we should be able to rotate Q around P five times and P around Q five times. And let's see what happens when we do that. So here is Q, and this is the one, two, three, four, and five, and there must be a Q prime atom here, okay? One, two, three, four, and five, and a Q prime atom should be here. That is, is five-fold rotation symmetry is allowed. Same thing but about P. Here is P, two, three, four, and five, and there should be a P prime atom here, okay? But if you look at it, you clearly see that the distance Q prime, P prime is shorter than the distance PQ, and this cannot be because we have chosen the closest atoms in that lattice. Okay, here's the proof. I passed the exam. Okay, so now let me take you to the reciprocal space. The atoms, as we, exist in the real space. Let me take you now to the reciprocal space. The reciprocal space is a mathematical space which we invented in order to understand diffraction patterns. And diffraction pattern is a Fourier transform, we should not go into that now, of the real space. So. Here is a diffraction pattern. In this case, it's an electron diffraction pattern. Electron diffraction pattern. What you do with, when you have an electron microscope is the following. You put in a specimen, and the specimen should be very, very thin, so, so thin as to allow an, a, a, an electron beam to go through. So electron beam comes from above, so, and it goes through the specimen. And on a phosphorus screen, at the bottom of the microscope, there is a pattern that is being created, which is called a diffraction pattern. And this is what you see there. So, the, the beam that goes through the specimen and does not diffract is, the, is this beam right here, a, li a little bit fat point right here, okay? This is the transmitted beam. All the other beams are diffracted beams. All these are diffracted beams. And the diffraction is created exactly according to the rules of the Bragg father and son, same, same rule as for X-ray diffraction. So th this uh, diffraction pattern exists in, uh, in the reciprocal space. And here, too, the rotational symmetries that are allowed exactly like in the real space, one, two, three, four, and six, no five, and nothing beyond six is allowed in the real space and in the reciprocal space. Okay, and uh, now the science of crystallography was a mature science. A mature science is a science in which it's believed that nothing new and shocking will ever be discovered. People, crystallographers said, the X-ray crystallographer said, we, we understand this science, we know what's going on, and nothing new is going to rock the boat in this science because it's a mature science. We understand everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then something happened. Now, what happened was a new definition of a crystal has emerged. And this definition of a crystal is an amazing definition. Let me read it to you, and you will see that it is a poem. It doesn't say a crystal is. It says, by crystal we mean very soft, any solid having an essentially discrete diffraction diagram. Essentially discrete diffraction diagram. Look at this sentence. It has a poetic value. And look at what it says. It defines a crystal by the reciprocal space. The diffraction pattern defines the crystal. Let's read it again. By crystal we mean any solid, any solid having an essentially discrete diffraction diagram. 
And by a periodic crystal, we mean, look here, any crystal in which three-dimensional lattice periodicity can be considered to be absent. Very, very soft, poetic definition for a crystal. Now, I would like you to know something. The people that decide about these definitions are no-nonsense mathematical crystallographers. These are hardcore scientists, mathematicians, and crystallographers. These are no-nonsense people, and they come out with a definition, which is a poem? What happened? What happened? And my talk is about what happened. So, 1982 was the 70th birthday of crystallography. Remember, 1912, 1982, 70th birthday. And this is the year when quasic periodic crystals were discovered. Now, in order to understand what happened that day of the discovery, let me take you to my laboratory, and uh, I will show you a page from my logbook, laboratory logbook, and many of you, if not all, are scientists, and of course, there are very mature, experienced scientists here, but also I see young people here, and so one of the good things that you can do when you perform an experiment is to write a logbook to describe your experiment because after some times when you perform many of them, you will forget what you did. So, but if you write it in a logbook, that's a good idea. So here is the logbook that I wrote that day. Now, this is, uh, you know, this is from the electron microscope. And in an electron microscope, you sit in the dark and usually the logbook you write for yourself. You don't write a logbook to show other people, right? So this is why the handwriting is very sloppy and it's a shorthand and all kinds of signs and marks here which are for me. But it became necessary to show it to you, so I apologize for the sloppiness. But, so let's see what information it does contain. If you look up here, you see that the date was April 8, 1982. Nice April day and I am in the dark of the electron microscope. The material I was working on was aluminum, 25 weight percent manganese. This was a rapidly solidified alloy that I have prepared in the laboratory. One of a series, a long series of alloys that I have prepared to study the phases that exist in them. And maybe I will tell you why I did all this. Anyway, so the numbers are, this is the plate number, 1720 is the plate number of the electron microscope. Those days, the plates were made of glass. We took pictures in the electron microscope on glass plates. Then came plastic, then came computer. We don't take pictures anymore nowadays. They go directly to the computer. Okay, no, no hardware. Well, anyway, so plate number. SAD means selected area diffraction. It's a, it's a diffraction pattern, and, and so on. And then I arrived at 1724. 36K magnification, and I say, that's interesting. I will show you this picture. I take a diffraction pattern, 1725, select the other diffraction, and I write 10 fold with three question marks? Cannot be, cannot be. What's going on there? Let me show you these pictures. This is a plate 1724, and what you see here is something very simple. This is a polycrystalline material. It is made of many crystals. And here is one crystal. You see that? That is the one crystal. Here is another one. Another one is here. But some of these crystals, and this is what's so, what's so interesting, some of the crystals are pitch black. This and this and this on the left. This is black. This is black. Now, when you see... Uh, this is a bright field image using that transmitted beam. If you see a picture like this, what it means is that either the specimen is very bad and thick and the electron beam doesn't go through, but don't think about me like that. I know how to prepare good specimens. So it's something else. And what it can be is that that crystal in this orientation diffracts heavily so that most of the energy goes through the diffraction and the transmitted beam has almost no intensity. This is why it looks so black. So I say to myself, hey, that's interesting. Let's take a diffraction pattern, and I take a diffraction pattern, just one grain. I put an aperture and look only at this grain and take a diffraction pattern, and this is what the diffraction pattern looks like. 
So I look at the diffraction pattern, and I say to myself, hmm, that's very odd. This is what they say today when they discover something. <laughs> Before they said, oh, Eureka! Yeah. This is interesting. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So look at it. This is the transmitter beam, central point. I look at the rotation symmetry, and I start to count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. No, 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 cannot be. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Tenfold, three question marks? That's very odd. But there is one more thing which is very important here. You see, you remember the previous electron diffraction pattern? It was periodic. Now here, there is no periodicity. Periodicity has gone. Look here. Take this line from here to here as an example. Take the distance from the center to this point and multiply it by two. You get here. And there's nothing there. The, di the, the ratio of distances between this distance divided by this distance is really the golden mean or the Fibonacci number tau, which is an irrational number. And what I just said is a bad sentence in logic. Because if you take two numbers and divide by each other, you cannot get an irrational number. This came from theory later on. OK. So I will tell you about Mr. Fibonacci uh, later, because everybody should know about Mr. Fibonacci, the blockhead of Pisa. You're right. He was the greatest mathematician of his time. So this is the uh, Fibonacci number tau. 1 plus root 5 divided by 2. It's an irrational number, 1.618, an endless number of digits behind it. So the ratio of this divided by this is the Fibonacci number tau. Everything is strange. So I say to myself, hmm, what can happen here is that these are twins, twins, I will explain what they are, twins in a regular periodic crystal. And I was looking for the twins, and I can tell you that I said to myself, okay, find the twins, record them, take a couple pictures, and forget it. And I spent the whole day looking for the twins, and they were not there. No twins. And I knew it from day one. Okay. So let's look at the experiment. But before go doing that, these are other diffraction patterns. You see, you can take your crystal, and you can tilt it to different orientations, and you can rotate it to different orientations and take the fraction pattern in each and every relevant orientation. So this is what I did. And so this is the tenfold. It turns out, by the way, that it is fivefold, but you cannot tell it by looking at the diffraction pattern. I, later on, I took Kikuchi patterns, which is something else, and that told me, hey, that's really fivefold. But that's not, yeah, it's not important now. So here is five, twofold, fivefold again, and in another direction, five, three, two, and three. And this is the set of diffraction pattern that defines an icosahedral symmetry. And I will tell you about the icosahedron in a couple of minutes. So this is the set of diffraction patterns. What are twins? This is what I thought we have. What you see here are twins in diamond. And these are very special twins and I will explain what they are. You see, this is you see, what you see here are atoms, yes? As every bright spot is an atom. This is, this is a one crystal, this is another crystal, number three, number four, number five. There are five crystals here. Forget about the sigma boundaries, we don't have time for that. So, this is one crystal, and the, this is the boundary. The red line is the boundary between this crystal and this crystal. But the boundaries are not just any boundaries. They are very special boundaries because they act like mirrors. Very special boundaries. Look here. Look at this. this is this some convolution in the, uh, somewhere in the projector? Or, or is it the, the bending of the uh, screen? Anyway, look at this, look at this uh, line of atoms. And when there is the border, it goes there. It's like a mirror image. This is the mirror image of that. And this is the mirror image of that. And that is the mirror image of that. 
and that is the mirror image of that, and so on. So these are twin boundaries. What we have here are five twins. These are five different crystals, five different orientations. Now, if you take a diffraction pattern from just one of them, like this one here, you'll get a periodic, nice diffraction pattern. But if you take a diffraction pattern from all of them together, all of them together, then you will have five superimposed diffraction pattern. One, two, three, four, five, 72 degrees from each other. Why 72? 360 divided by five. And this is what I thought I have. I have a five-fold rotation symmetry. It means I have a series of twins which have special orientation. I'll show you another example. Here is another example. This, this, uh, this crystal, uh, uh, these are very abundant crystals in the aluminum iron system. And they're quite large. You can see them with an optical microscope. And what you have, look at this flower. This is a single crystal on the left. Here is another one. Here is another one. If you count them, you see that there are 10 of them. But really, there are five because this crystal here is exactly the same orientation as this. And this crystal here is exactly the same orientation as this. So there are five orientations here. And again, the same thing. If you take a diffraction pattern from one, you'll get a periodic lattice. But if you take a diffraction pattern from all of them, you'll get five superimposed diffraction patterns. And here is the example. These are five superimposed diffraction patterns. It looks like, more or less like what I found. And this is why I, the, I took these pictures years ago. By the way, here's a funny story. I took this picture when I was a student. I did my PhD, and, and uh, they were twins, and so I thought it was not interesting, and I, I never published anything about it. And then later, in later years, in fact, a couple of years ago, I discovered that uh, two crystallographers published five papers just on this, <laughs> which is remarkable. <laughs> How could they? I mean, what, what, what did they have to write? It looked, it looked so simple to me, I didn't thought about even uh, publishing it. Anyway, so this, uh, these are uh, five, and if you want to see just one of them, here is one. Okay, you see this periodic diffraction pattern, and there are five of them superimposed. This is what I had in my mind when I saw the five-fold rotation symmetry diffraction pattern. So I performed a series of experiments. I will just briefly go through them very quickly. These are called dark field experiments, and it means taking um, pictures through diffraction spot, using just one diffraction spot, and if there are twins, then only a few twins contribute to each spot, and I should see only them. But everywhere I looked, I saw the whole crystal. No, there were no twins. And uh, I did another pattern, another uh, experiment. This is called microdiffraction or seabed, convergent beam electron diffraction. What you do with convergent beam electron diffraction is the following. You take the electron beam and you converge it onto a very, very small spot, as small as you can. And on that microscope, that spot was about 400 angstroms, 40 nanometers. It was an old Philips, excellent Philips microscope. Uh, and this was the size of the spot. And I said, okay, if the twins are very, very small, and then with a small beam, I will hit one of them. And if I hit one, I'll see a periodic diffraction pattern. Never happened. Everywhere I went, this was the diffraction pattern. Always had FIFO. So I understood that the symmetry is a property of the material rather than defects in the material. Uh, this is a more modern picture. It was taken by colleagues of mine, not by me, uh, in France. And they had, uh, France had uh, excellent high-resolution microscopes. Uh, they were leaders in high-resolution electron microscopy for a while. And then they lost uh, to other countries. But uh, at that time, in the uh, early uh, 80s, they were really leaders in high-resolution microscopy. And colleagues of mine in Paris took this picture. So what you see here, you see the atomic structure of the, what we call the icosahedral phase. I still owe you a story about icosahedron. And this is the electron diffraction pattern. Okay, no big deal. But what they did more was the following. They also took a optical diffraction pattern. So what you can do 
is take this picture and create an optical diffraction pattern, either by a laser beam or on the computer by doing a Fourier transform. Nowadays, you do it on the computer. And they got, of course, the same thing. So, oppa. They have received, what am I doing wrong? Okay. This thing here, this diffraction pattern, electron diffraction pattern, is exactly the same as this. And you can say, of course, because both are Fourier transform of the same image. But they did, they did something more. They put an aperture, and the aperture could shrink and shrink and shrink. Now, this pattern eventually disappeared for lack of information, but it didn't split into periodic structure, into periodic diffraction pattern. No twins, no twins, no twins. Why am I saying it five times? You'll see soon. Okay. This is a more modern picture, forget it. The discovery was uh, made at National Bureau of Standards where I spent two years of sabbatical, 1981 to 1983, and the discovery was made a few months after my arrival there. Now, for two years, I couldn't make a lot of progress and I met a lot of resistance. And then I came back to the Technion. At the Technion, this was after my sabbatical. At the Technion, I met the first person who was willing to work with me. His name is Ilan Blech. He was a professor at the Technion. Soon after we published this uh, paper, he left uh, to California for, to do some business. And we sent this paper for publication to a journal called Journal of Applied Physics. Um, those days, you sent papers for publication by mail, you remember, envelopes, and stamps, there were stamps, and, and we could not type the paper. We had secretaries that typed the papers, can you imagine? And so my secretary typed the paper, my generation right. nod their heads, right? <laughs> <laughs> of course, the young people do not understand what I'm talking about. But anyway, so... We sent that paper, and uh, two, three weeks later, the paper came back with a letter saying, Dr. Schertmann, thank you very much for your interest in our journal, uh, but we will not publish your paper because uh, we decided that it will not be of interest to the community of physicists. Okay. Why don't you send it to a metallurgical journal, they said. So I sent it to a metallurgical journal, journal um, Metallurgical Transactions. They accepted it and published it. But they published it deep, it's a slow publication, deep into 1985, June of 1985. And I sent it in October of 1984. In the meantime, I was again for the summer at NBS, National Bureau of Standards, and I showed the paper that was rejected to my host, John Kahn, and I asked him, why do you think it was rejected? John read it, and we had some discussion and argument, and then he said, Danny, this is fantastic. We have something fantastic. Why don't we do something totally different? Send a quick publication without the Elon Blech model to a fast publication, to, and the fast publication was to PRL, Physical Review Letters, and he added, of course, his name was there, and also another name, Denis Gratias. Denis Gratias is a mathematical crystallographer from France, at the time in Vitry, in France, and uh, he came to, to give the stamp of approval because John Kahn was a thermodynamic person, but not a crystallographer. Anyway, four names on that paper, and this was the first paper that was published, although it was written the second. And when uh, that paper was published, and uh, it was published in November of uh, 1984, Immediately, hell broke loose because from all over the world, I started to get telephones and emails and you name it. Danny, we have it, we have it, this is fantastic. And very quickly, a new, bold, avant-garde body of scientists started to grow around the globe and to study quasi-periodic materials. They took my discovery and made it into a science that later on employed thousands of scientists around the world. Okay, so this was uh, the history. Now, a few words about icosahedral symmetry, and then we'll go back to the story. This is an icosahedron, a platonic body, and uh, it has uh, five, uh, six five-fold axes, 10 three-fold axes, and 15 two-fold axes. 
Let me explain. If you look from here to the center, put your eye here, not too close, it's pretty. From here to the center, you see that there is a five-fold rotation symmetry. Same here, same here, 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 and here. There are six of them, five here, six. This down here is just a negative of that. So these are the five, uh, the six five-fold. Look here, you see the triangle? This is a three-fold symmetry. There are 10 axes like this, and so on. This is the Nikoshedron, and my diffraction pattern, a set of diffraction patterns, had the same symmetry. So this is why I called it the icosahedral phase, because it has icosahedral symmetry. Enough of that. Uh, of course, in this country, you would better recognize the symmetry on a football, <laughs> and um, so you can see the five-fold rotation symmetry here, two-fold here, and three-fold here. And I doubt very much that the football players know that they play with icosahedral symmetry. Even Manchester United doesn't know about it. So, I don't think that he resigned because of that. Anyway, um, a word about uh, Leonardo Fibonacci of Pisa. This is the young man, Leonardo Fibonacci of Pisa. His friends called him Blockhead. I will never understand why. He was so bright. And uh, this is a picture of a statue on his grave. Now, Mr. Fibonacci de Pisa is buried behind the inclined tower of Pisa. Just behind the inclined tower of Pisa, there's a graveyard under a roof, and he's buried there. So if you visit, ever visit the inclined tower of Pisa, go to the graveyard just 50 meters behind it, find his statue and grave, and say hello to me. <laughs> hmm? Yeah, of course. Fibonacci, hey, <laughs> of course. This is the statue, the statue on his grave. Anyway, um, what you should know about Fibonacci is the Fibonacci rabbits. And this is a, a very interesting thought experiment, a Duncan experiment, as we say. And uh, these are the Fibonacci rabbits. So what is the story about the Fibonacci rabbits? Now, this is general knowledge. Everybody should know about Fibonacci rabbits, right? Okay, look here. In the first month, we have a female rabbit, and she has, I don't know, a husband or a boyfriend who comes to visit, and she is now pregnant. Okay. So now, in the second month, she gives birth to a little one. In the third month, the same scenario, she gives birth to a little one, and this little one has to mature before it can reproduce. So now it is mature in the third month. In the fourth month, this mother gives birth to a little one, this little one matures, and this mother gives birth to a little one. That's it. These are the Fibonacci rabbits. And now that you understand the rule, you can continue this list forever because you understand the rule. So there is order. If there is a rule that you can follow, there is order. Okay. Now, the numbers on the left are the number of rabbits in each month. So in the first month, you have one. In the second month, two. In the third month, three. In the fourth month, you have five. And then eight, and 13, and 21, and so on. One plus two is three. Two plus three is five. Five plus eight, 13. 13 plus 21 will be 34. 34 plus 21 will be 55, and so on and so forth. These are the number of rabbits. These are also known as the Fibonacci numbers. A series of numbers known as the Fibonacci numbers, and they have very interesting properties. There are two things that you want to know about this. Number one, you want to know that what I just said, that the number of rabbits in each given month equals the sum of the number of rabbits in the two previous months. This is what this equation says. You also want to know that if you go with this series to infinity, n goes to infinity, then the number of rabbits in the last month divided by the number of rabbits in the previous month is or reaches at the limit the Fibonacci number 1 plus root 5 divided by 2, which is 1.618034, and so on and so forth. So this is the Fibonacci number tau, but something which is relevant to our talk today, I did not mention, and I will do it now. What happens is the following. Look here. We have a large or a grown-up uh, rabbit and a young one. Large, small, and then large, large, small. Large, small, large, large, small, large, large, small, large, small, and so on and so forth. If you look for a motif of any size that repeats itself periodically, there is none. There is no motif of any size that repeats itself periodically. 
This is a quasi-periodic array in one dimension. This is the Fibonacci series. And this is why it is so relevant to our talk today. Quasi-periodic array in one dimensions. Okay. And this is the story. He published it in the year 1202. Now, what about two dimensions? Quasi-periodicity in two dimensions. We have Penrose styles. Penrose is an eminent British mathematician, philosopher, physicist, a great man living in our times. And this is, these are the Penrose styles. Uh, these are composed of two tiles, thin rhombus and thick rhombus. Just forget about the colors. Thin, thin, thick, 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 thin, and so on and so forth. These are only two tiles, thin rhombus and thick rhombus, and these two rhombi, if placed according to magic rules, we have to know how to put them together, it's not difficult, then you create a quasi-periodic array in two dimensions. No motif that repeats itself of any size. Two-dimensional quasi-periodicity. What about three-dimensional quasi-periodicity? Three-dimensional, these are quasi-periodic crystals, and here is just one, and you can see the beautiful facets, five-fold facets, in this crystal, magnesium, zinc, cerium. It was taken by one of my students in the laboratory. Okay, now, up to now, you heard stories, and now I would like you to think for a few minutes, and then I'll tell you stories again. So let us think. And uh, I want to uh, tell you about the cut and projection method. It's a very simple trick in mathematics, and you can really enjoy it. Now look here. What you can do is the following. Here is a periodic array. Assume that in each intersection, there is a mathematical point. It means a point with no dimension, okay? So here, down here, there's a mathematical point, and here, and here, and here, and so on. Each intersection, there's a mathematical point with no dimension. Now, this is a periodic array, clearly. What we can do now is make a cut. What is a cut? It's a strip that I shoot in a certain direction, and that direction is not just any direction. The tangent of alpha is the Fibonacci number tau, which is an irrational number. Now, if this line, oh, 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 no, 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 wait, back, 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 okay, sorry. If this line starts at the mathematical point here and goes in this irrational direction, that means that the tangent is an irrational direction, it means that this line will never ever meet any other point. It must be so, because if it met a point, then the tangent would be a rational number. But I sent it into an irrational number. Okay, so now what you can do is the following. You take all the points that are inside, this one here and this and this, inside the strip, and project them onto the line. So this point here, you project onto the line here. This point here, you project on the line here. This point here, you project here, and so on and so forth. And now look what we have. Look at the distances. Large, large, small. Large, large, small. Large, small. Large, large, small. We have created the Fibonacci series. We have created by cut and project this is what we call it, the cut and project, and e, a, a quasi-periodic array in a lower dimensional space. I repeat this, this sentence clearly. We took a high dimensional space, two-dimensional space. We made a cut, which is periodic. We made a cut and project, and we have created a quasi-periodic array in a lower dimensional space, which is a line. Okay. So if you have some time this evening, especially the youngs among you, then you can take a six-dimensional space, make a cut and project onto a three-dimensional space, and then you created a new quasi-periodic crystal. Does it exist in nature? Maybe yes, maybe no. We don't know. Just if you have time. Okay. <laughs> now, let me show you something else which is interesting. Here I repeat my experiment. These are, these are the lines, and the tangent of alpha was, one, was Fibonacci number. Now I bring other lines, which are almost exactly like the black lines. These red lines are almost exactly, but not quite. Because although they emerge from one point, I made 
uh, um, intentionally, the red line meet this point here. So there is periodicity. It's a large periodicity. This is one unit, and then there will be another unit, and so on and so forth. But this is periodic. But because it is very much near the quasi-periodic, then such crystals do exist, many, many of them, and uh, we call them approximants because they are approximately quasi-periodic, but they're periodic. It's interesting that periodic crystals are proud to be approximants near quasi-periodicity. Okay, so in this case, the tangent is 11 divided by 7. You can count it. It's 11 divided by 7, and it's a ratio number 1 plus, uh, I'm sorry, 1.5714. Okay, enough of this. Now to the story. When I started to talk about um, my findings and five-fold rotation symmetry and no periodicity and so on and so forth, the reaction in my laboratory at NBS was sort of mixed. Um, some people were positive. My host, John Kahn, was positive and encouraging. He said to me, Danny, this material is telling us something, and I challenge you to tell us what it is was encouraging. My group leader, who was a traditional X-ray crystallographer, came to my office one day and said, Danny, uh, what you are saying cannot be. Please read this book and you will understand what, what you are saying <laughs> cannot be. It was a book on X-ray crystallography. <laughs> and I said to him, you know, I know this book. I don't need to read it. I teach at the Technion. I know the book. I'm telling you, my material is not in the book. Took the book back, came back a couple of days later, and he said to me, Danny, you are a disgrace to my group. I cannot work with you. Please leave my group. <laughs> so I left his group. It, it sounds traumatic, but it was not really, because I, had, I just had to find another arrangement, join another group, and instead of reporting to his secretary, to report to another secretary, and that was about it. I didn't have to uh, leave my office or leave my laboratory. But, but it was in the air, the negative feeling. And, you know, I walk in the corridor and people sort of look at me with a funny eye. And, you know, these people come here to do their postdocs and what do they do here? They come up with these crazy ideas and everybody knows that they cannot be. And if you want to see how I felt during that period of time, it was something like that. <laughs> okay. So that was during 1982 to 1984, from the discovery to the first publication. So it was you know, not, not very easy. <laughs> but that, that kept, became a tiger later on, so. <laughs> okay. So this was the first year. In 1984, we had the first publication. So you would think that by now there is a growing community of uh, people who study quasi-periodic materials, then that's the end of rejection and the end of objection. Not so, because then there was the International Union of Crystallography. And they said the following, Danny, we do not trust electron diffraction because they're not accurate and don't tell us stories about electron diffraction. Come up with X-ray diffraction. Now, many of you know that in order to get a single crystal X-ray diffraction, at least those days, this is 30 years ago, you needed a crystal of some size, single quasi-periodic crystal of some size. What size? Like a grain of sand. I mean, a fraction of a millimeter. Something that you can hardly feel between your fingers is enough. But we did not have that size crystal. Our crystals were micron, one micron in size. We needed 100 times larger crystal. Tenths of a millimeter would be enough. It took us three years for the community to grow such crystals. Nowadays, you can grow crystal as the micro size. No problem. But those days, it was difficult. And so, in 1987, the first X-ray diffraction pattern from a single quasi-periodic crystal came and it was done by two colleagues of mine, one in Japan and one in France. They sent me this diffraction pattern. This was sent from Japan, but I also have from France. Beautiful diffraction pattern. You can see 
the five-fold flower here, the three-fold, the two-fold here. Wonderful pictures. I showed this picture in the meeting of the International Union of Pisellography in Perth, Australia in 1987. And when I show this picture, which was one of many pictures in the show, they said, okay, Danny, now you're talking. They took these results, made a committee that redefined crystals. It took some years to do that. But the committee of the International Union of Crystallography redefined crystal, and this was the paradigm shift in crystallography, a new foundation for the science of crystallography. Okay, this was 1987. So you would think, okay, now, I mean, the International Union of Crystallography accepted crystals to the community, quasi-periodic crystal to community of crystal. I mean, who will object? Yes, one person did. And that person uh, was Professor Linus Pauling. Now, Linus Pauling was uh, the most eminent chemist of the 20th century, definitely in the United States and possibly in the world. I mean, he really was a great teacher, uh, wrote books, explained basic phenomena in chemistry. I mean, he was great. He was also a flamboyant speaker. And he stood on stage saying, Danny Schertman is talking nonsense. There are no quasi-crystals, just quasi-scientists. <laughs> I was there. I heard it. Now, uh, Linus Pauling was a traditional exocrystallographer. He claimed that quasi-periodic materials are just twinned in a periodic lattice, which I knew from day one they were not. No twins. But he was a theoretician and an X-ray crystallographer, and every time he spoke, he pulled from under the podium a model, and he says, okay, this is a periodic crystal. You twin it here and here and here, and you'll get what Schertmann has on his diffraction pattern. And a couple of days later, somebody writes a short comment saying, no, Professor Pollen, you're wrong. It, your model doesn't work. He said, okay, 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 okay. And next time he puts a larger model. Now, now that you know the cut and project method, you will understand what he did. He produced approximants. And he was getting closer and closer to becoming quasi-periodic. But he could never reach there because he was insisting on periodicity. It is like somebody saying to you, I can prove to you that the number pi is really a racial number. Here, let me measure the circumference of a circle. Let me measure the diameter. I divide them by each, by one another, and you get a, a period, uh, you get a, a racial number. They say, yeah, but it's close to pi, but not quite. Okay, okay, let's take a larger one. We measured it in centimeters, now we measure it in millimeters. Here I get, this is it. Yes, yes, you really get closer, but pi is not pi. And then a larger and larger circle, larger and larger models, larger and larger models. He got closer and closer and closer. He could never reach, he could never reach the e racial number tau by dividing two numbers by one another. This is it. So if you insist on periodicity, you can never think about quasi periodicity. This was his great mistake. And he, he fought. Uh, for 10 years, and then in August of uh, 1994, Professor Pauling died, and this was the end of rejection. Now, I must tell you something. Professor Pauling was not alone. The whole American Chemical Society was behind him. And, you know, people that were not experimentalists and they were theoreticians, here is this great Linus Pauling the greatest scientist, and here is, what's his name, Schertmann. I mean, who are you going to believe? The son <laughs> or one of these? Okay. So this, the shame was on the American Chemical Society. Not Linus Pauling has his idea, but the number of followers is unbelievable. Hundreds of thousands of followers, so it was not alone. But when he died, so did the rejection. Number, now, down here is the month. This, the year is 1986. This is January, February, March, April, and so on. And we are now in July, so we are somewhere here. It was in the summer, in July, that I came there. 
n is the number of pages in the bibliography. We had a secretary that was hired to just collect all the papers on quasi-periodic materials and file them. And she typed a list of all the papers. So each page on the list contained maybe 20 papers on each page. And we had, and she filed it. So it was very organized, very well organized. And what my colleague, uh, Bob Schaefer, who did it, uh, did, he just took the book of pages that she typed and counted the number of pages in each and every month. So, uh, and he marked here one over n. n is the number of pages, this is one over n. So 0 0.1 means 10 pages in the, the bibliography, okay? 10 pages mean about 200 papers. So in January, we had so many pages and February, March, April, and so on. And in July, we had so many papers. And as a good scientist, he connected them with a straight line. And to our horror, we discovered <laughs> that in December of 1986, the number of, number of publication on quasi-periodic materials will reach infinity. <laughs> and all the trees in the Amazon will have to be cut just to produce the paper. <laughs> Mr. Klabin would have to do that here in this country. Yeah? <laughs> well, that didn't happen. <laughs> but, but this was the feeling that the world is really exploding around us. With, with activity. Okay. Now, this is just a pretty picture uh, that was made by a colleague of mine, An Peng Tsai, in, uh, in, um, uh, in Sendai, uh, Japan. And these are crystals in uh, aluminum 14 weight percent manganese. So you can see the five fold rotation symmetry here, and the three fold here, and the two fold here. Very beautiful picture. And he painted it artificially to look like the cherry blossom which they like so much in, uh, in Japan. Okay, I would like to sum up the following. While order before was synonym to periodicity, now we know that order can be periodic, it can, it can be quasi-periodic, and it is open-ended. If somebody will come up and say, I have discovered a new kind of order in crystals, we listen. They didn't before, but now we all listen. We are listening to new discovery. We appreciate humble scientists. A humble scientist, somebody who is willing to listen, is a good scientist. Okay. Now, we'll skip the properties for sake of time, but I want to ask, because I let, I'm going to let you ask a question. I'm going to ask the first question, and I will answer it, and then you can ask your question. So, my question is, why is it that it took 70 years for the first quasi-periodic materials to be observed at all? Why, why did it take 70 years from 1912 till 1982? 70 years of crystallography and nobody saw quasi-periodic materials before. Is it because they're very rare? Maybe they, only two of them exist in nature and I happen to stumble upon one of them? Or is it because they're not stable? You look at them, they disintegrate or you touch them and they transform into something periodic. Or maybe they're difficult to make magic hands made one, or maybe they are made of esoteric materials, very strange esoteric materials, gadolinium, presidinium, and a touch of zinc in the corner. <laughs> Who knows? Well, let me answer that question. Number one, they are not rare. There are hundreds upon hundreds of quasi-periodic materials. This is not the reason that they were not discovered. They are all over the place. They are very abundant. Here is a partial list of different composition based on aluminum alone, and there are many other based on other elements. No, this is not the reason why they were not discovered. They're not rare. Are they not stable? Well, many are not stable. Some are stable. Stable means that they melt congruently. When you hit the mom, they do not transform. They will eventually melt, but they do not transform. But those that are not stable, that are metastable, are stable at room temperature, and they are stable up to about 350 to 400 degrees C. You can clearly study them. No objection to that. Okay. So, maybe they're difficult to make. Not at all. They're very, very easy to make. You can make them by casting, by rapid solidification, by single crystal growth, by electrical precision, CVD, PVD. Any technology that you make any other metallic alloy, you can make quasi-periodic crystal. It is easy to do. Are they made of esoteric materials? Not at all. 
We talk aluminum and iron and copper and titanium and nickel and chromium. Do you know how many millions of tons of, of iron are used every year? It's all over the place. No, this is not the reason. So why is it? Now let me give you my answer. From now on, it started to be subjective. Up to now, it was objective. Number one, TM. Quasi-periodic crystals had to be discovered by transmission electron microscopy because they were very small. And if you take an X-ray pattern of many small crystals, you lose the rotation symmetry. You do not see the rotation symmetry of one. You get rings instead of spots. So X-ray could not be useful to, for the discovery. Later on, for accurate measurements, yes, but for the discovery, you need a TM. Okay, so you say, okay, big deal. I mean, there are thousands upon thousands of people doing TM in the world every day. So why you? Ah, okay. You also have to be a professional. Now, most students that do, that perform TEM work, spend a few days on the microscope, and that's about it. Reason is that if you want to become an expert on electron microscopy, you have to spend years on the microscope, you have to know the theory, you have to follow the developments, you have to be an electron microscopist, a specialist in electron microscopy. And there are very few people who do that, very few. I can tell you that in my department at the Technion, we are leaders in Israel in electron microscopy. We always have, we always have the best microscope. All my students dedicate time to electron microscopy. And there are very many people that do electron microscopy. Over the last 40 years, we produce maybe, maybe 15 electron microscopies. And thousands use the electron microscope. Very few become professionals. You had to become a professional. Okay. That's not enough. You have to have tenacity. Tenacity meaning act like a Rottweiler dog. When you bite, don't let go. Don't let go. <laughs> if you find something interesting, and I'm talking to the young people who sit in the back, if you find something interesting and odd in science, then in most cases it will be an artifact. But in some cases, just in some cases, you made a great discovery. Don't let go. Let me tell you a story that you may remember. There is at least one person who saw my diffraction pattern before me. How do I know that? His professor tells me, this is a country in Europe, and his professor tells me the following. One day he says, I look at the slides, glass plates, that my students took in past years, and I find one which is your diffraction pattern. I look at the date before you. So I called my ex-student, by now a professor in another university, and I said to him, my dear student, he said, do you know that you saw the trifold rotation symmetry diffraction pattern before Danny Schechtman? Says the ex student, of course, professor, of course I know. Says the professor, why didn't you tell me? Said the student, well, professor, you see, if I told you, you would want me to stay for two more years on my PhD? <laughs> Tenacity, don't let go if you find something odd. Okay. Believe in yourself. If you are a professional and you have a character and you know that you are right, just stand tall. Let other people try to convince you that you are wrong. Listen. But if they don't, don't give up. Don't give up. And last but not least, uh, resilience. You know, my promotion was delayed and so on and so forth. And I had uh, quite a few troubles uh, during my academic uh, career because of that. Then, changed as you know but but it took I had some some difficult years and people laughed at me uh, in front of me and behind my back and so just you know believe in yourself and have some resilience okay thanks very much Thank you very much, Dan, for this wonderful talk. Uh, we have time for uh, questions, comments. Why not sevenfold? Why not? Okay, we have the following by now. 
what has been discovered by now is the following. We have fivefold, we have eightfold, tenfold, and twelvefold. You are welcome to discover the seventh. <laughs> it's the door is not never closed. Okay, other question? Yes. Hi, Professor. Uh, you said sometimes that uh, we're finding something uh, quasi-crystals in astrophysics also. Uh, molecules that behave like quasi-crystals. Is this true? In, in astrophysics? Yes. Um, you mean galaxies behave like quasi-crystals? Hmm, I'll have to put them to the microscope. Okay. <laughs> no. I, uh, Maybe telescope. <laughs> I am an electromicroscopist. <laughs> you know, if you go to, if you go to a, an eye doctor, if you say that you, your stomach is, is, has a problem, he will give you eye drops. So <laughs> this is it. I am an electromicroscopist. Okay, no, I didn't hear about that. I don't, I don't know about galaxies, but, uh, you know, it's an interesting idea. Yes. This was certainly uh, the best propaganda for mathematics, and in particular, Fibonacci numbers. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Fibonacci was, I mean, he was a great, great, great mathematician. Yes, maybe you can just talk. Uh, so when a, when a student or a colleague comes to you with really odd results, you know. How do you apply your experience when you look at those results? I mean, how do you know to tell someone to stick to it, keep doing your research, this could be right, okay. when the great, you know, the biggest chance that it's not right, and it, okay. it is an artifact. I understand so. your question. There are two types of scientists, as you well know. There are experimentalists, and there are theoreticians. In most cases nowadays, you know, Einstein was a theoretician. But he paved the way for a good number of experimentalists. Usually, this is not the case. Usually, it's a discovery that opens the way for the uh, theoreticians to explain. Theoreticians have this tendency to explain everything, whether it's right or wrong. Look, for instance, at poly water. All right? You know how many Theoreticians explain poly water that happen, happen to be nonsense at the end, and there are many things like this. To the point, if you're an experimentalist, and if you are one of my students, you would be an experimentalist, then I propose to you to repeat your experiments and prove to yourself. And then take me to the laboratory, show me the experiment, I'll do it with you to prove that you didn't have any mistake, that it's not an artifact. Because in most cases, it will be an artifact. But in some cases, and this is why you should listen, because in some cases, you made a great discovery, something very odd. A spot, at one, one point, it doesn't fall on a straight line. It's here or here or there. This is a discovery. Yeah? Or it's an artifact. You didn't measure properly. So for an experimentalist, it's very easy to prove that whether you are right or wrong. Just repeat the experiments and see that it's right. And this is why it is so important that when somebody, and I'm saying it for a purpose, if somebody makes a discovery on a single specimen that only he has, then I can tell you that in biology, you cannot publish your paper if you do not share it with other. Because this is why it's called research. Search again, okay? We need assurance that your findings are correct. And nowadays, we have one case in which somebody has one simple specimen. He will not share it with anybody. And he publishes papers on this specimen. And God knows whether it's right or wrong. I tend to believe, but I need proof. OK, so go back to your question. Repeat the experiments. And check it yourself or with colleagues or with your professor and show that you are correct. Other questions? if you have an example of something that's not a metallic alloy that is a quasi-crystal. Yes, uh, almost all uh, crystals are intermetallic compounds. Uh, there is one case that I know of 
of uh, a polymer uh, that behaves like the decagonal phase. Decagonal uh, means that there is quasi-periodicity in the plane, but the planes are stacked periodically. Okay? So somebody found a polymer that is shaped like a wedge, and there are five wedges in the plane, but, but the planes are stacked periodically. So this is sort of quasi-periodicity. Modulated structures would not be a sort of what you are finding with this. Yeah. Okay, yes, this, this was really the beginning of the science, but it never expanded into something, yeah. So that's right, it was, it was the beginning, but nobody realized that it is a beginning of something. Now when we look back, we know that it was the beginning of something. A question there. You met uh, Professor Lyons pulling directly to uh, discuss your ideas because sometimes having adversaries uh, is good because they check really your hypothesis. But sometimes or a lot of time they become friends. So, but did you met, did you met Pauling personally to discuss the quasi did I, did, I, did I meet Professor Pauling in person? Yeah. Yeah, we met several times, uh, and I can tell you that when we had the dinner in one of the conferences. Uh, uh, people uh, were looking, you know, we had just the two of us having dinner, but, uh, but the hall was full of people and everybody was looking for the feast and there were no feasts. Uh, we, everybody was a gentleman and uh, we agreed about everything, uh, vitamin C included, but not about quasi-periodicity. So this was the only... And then at one point I went to Palo Alto. He had a... Uh, he lived in Palo Alto, California. And, and I gave him a talk, like the talk I gave today, only with slides. At that time we had slides. You young generation don't know about that, but <laughs> you're com the computer generation. Anyway, so I gave him a talk for one, one hour of the talk, and in the end of my talk, he said, uh, Dr. Schechtman, I don't know how you do that. That means that he did not understand electron microscopy. So, if it were somebody else, I would say, okay, if you don't know how I do that, why don't you go read the book? But Linus Pauling wrote the book, so I wouldn't say to Linus Pauling. <laughs> so, all I said was, Professor Pauling, uh, let me ask you something. If you ever agree with me, don't keep it a secret. <laughs> he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in late, later, close to, I guess it was 19, 1982, uh, I'm sorry, 1992 or so, he wrote me a letter. I was at the Technion at the time. And the letter said more or less like the following, uh, Professor Schechtman, may I propose to you to write the joint paper, the Schechtman polling paper, and you will be the first, he wrote the Schaffman polling paper on quasi-periodic materials. And I answered him, again, later, you know, stem, uh, Professor Pauling, I'll be delighted to write this paper with you, but before we even start, we have to agree that quasi-periodic materials do exist. <laughs> and so he wrote me a letter back saying, uh, well, that may be too early for that. <laughs> and, uh, and then a couple years later, uh, he passed away, and that was the end of our communication. I propose to take the last question from Professor Nussenstein and then we break for uh, a few minutes before the Professor Rusty Well, this is just a comment in defense of Pauling in the sense that quasi crystals don't exist and crystals don't exist because a true existence would mean having an infinite material, okay? You approximate a crystal with finite sizes. You approximate irrational numbers. And as you were saying, you approximate quasi-crystals by making them uh, larger and larger. So in this sense, they exist in the same way as crystals, but both in another sense do not exist. <laughs> okay. Then, before we thank you, let me tell you that you remind me very much of a, an Israeli colleague of yours who came to Princeton when I was a student there, and he was a theoretician, proposing substructures for quarks. And he called these uh, substructures Rishans and Tevons. And somebody in the audience said, but uh, you know, why do you think these things should exist? And then he told a parable. He said that uh, there was this young guy passing, uh, near the Dead Sea, and he saw an old man who was throwing uh, wheat seeds 
on the sea. And uh, he asked what the guy was doing. He said, well, I'm trying to uh, raise a wheat field. And the young man said, but uh, don't you see that this is impossible? And the old man replied, but imagine if I succeed. <laughs> I think that we just had a clear example, not with an old man, but with a very young man, of a successful story against all odds. Thank you very much for the talk.